Good afternoon from the Consulate General of uh, Greece in Boston, uh, the city of uh, Phil Helene Americans, Samuel Gridley Howe, and Edward Everett. Uh, my name is Stratos Ekthimiou, and I would like to uh, welcome you all to today's lecture featuring the distinguished professor of history, Dr. Alexander Kitroev, who will talk on uh, American Phil Helenians. Uh, this lecture is possible thanks to our uh, collaboration with uh, College Year in Athens, and I would like to thank uh, its president, Mr. Philaktopoulos. And uh, our event is under the auspices of the uh, Embassy of Greece in the USA. And uh, I would like to um, thank our uh, ambassador, uh, Alexandra Papadopoulou, for her uh, continued support and encouragement for honoring us uh, for, uh, uh, with her presence today. And uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you so much. Uh, some 10 days ago, the Consulate General of Greece uh, in Boston, together with the college here in Athens, uh, hosted another uh, very interesting discussion uh, with Professor Mazauer about the meaning of the Greek Revolution of 1821. As we celebrate the 200th uh, anniversary of the start of the Greek Revolution, again, the Consul General of Greece in Boston and College here in Athens uh, are hosting another equally interesting event, uh, hosting Professor Alexander Kitroev uh, speaking about uh, uh, the philalinism in the United States. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Philaktopoulos and College here in Athens for their extraordinary work uh, and also my colleague, uh, the, uh, Consul General, Mr. Efthimiu, about all the effort he puts uh, in this series of events uh, celebrating the 200th anniversary of Greek independence. Philhellenism around the world was one of the main components uh, of the success of Greek revolution 200 years ago. But especially Philhellenism in the United States uh, has a particular meaning to to the great political underpinning foundation of the relationship between the American and the Greek people. The big American Federation was built politically, ideologically, philosophically. Its system was built on the ideals and principles of Greek civilization, of Hellenism. So in this context, uh, the Greek revolution was inspired uh, by the American revolution and uh, the American the new American nation was uh, drawn to help the fight and the plight of the Greeks who had revolted against tyranny. The letters between Corais and Jefferson, as well as the hymn to freedom of the Onisio Solomosa, uh, which is the national anthem of Greece, uh, speak about this great connection about the American and the Greek people. Without any further delay, I would love, uh, I'm looking forward uh, to hearing uh, Professor Kitroev uh, for his remarks. He has done an extensive research uh, into American philhellenism. Um, I have read quite a bit about uh, his work, uh, uh, but uh, it's a different thing to hear him in person. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Ambassador, once again for saluting this celebratory lecture on the occasion of the bicentennial of the uh, Greek Revolution. Uh, I'm delighted that the Consulate General uh, of Greece in Boston and College here in Athens can co-host again one, and, uh, one, more, uh, one more event of this sort. Um, our Consul General in Boston, uh, Stratos Efimiu, has been doing phenomenal work uh, for Greece uh, and under his leadership, the Consulate has opened new roads and uh, has used the challenges of the pandemic to foster closer ties with uh, Greek origin academics and business people and uh, others uh, of Greek origin in the Boston area. Uh, for those uh, of you who do not know CYA, let me just say briefly that it's an educational institution that uh, is serving American uh, youth for almost 60 years. Uh, by fostering intercultural competence and offering programs of Greek civilization in Athens. Uh, it has about 10,000 alumni so far and has been helping American college students uh, study Greece, learn 
about another culture and about themselves and in the process become spiritual friends of Greece. And it is here where CYA intersects with the theme of our lecture today. Uh, CYA has been bringing out little armies of philelines in our times, whereas our lecture today will concentrate on the philhellenic spirit that has swept the US, that swept rather the US before and during the Greek War of Independence. Uh, today, we have the honor to have with us um, Alexander Kitroev, a professor uh, of history at Haverford College in Pennsylvania. He has also uh, taught recently at CYA. Uh, we were very lucky to have him uh, do a teacher course on the history of uh, the Greek Jews. And uh, uh, Alexander has also been helping us in, as, a, as a member of the uh, academic advise, advisory roundtable of CYA. Uh, Kitrev was born in Athens. He left Greece at the age of 14. He went to England uh, and finished his schooling there. He got his first degree at Warwick University, his master's degree at Kiel, uh, and then uh, he had his doctorate at Oxford in modern history. He taught uh, soon after, in the 80s, he taught uh, at the Byzantine and Modern uh, Greek Center at Queens College at the City University of New York. And uh, in the 90s, he was at the Onassis Center for Hellenic Studies at New York University. And finally settled in the history department of uh, Haverford College. Uh, his research focuses on ethnicity in modern Greece and the diaspora, covering a, a spectrum from politics to, to sports. He has published five books uh, uh, to name, well, he has, he, has, he has written on the Greeks of Egypt, for one thing, then a lot on the Greeks in the Americas. He is, uh, I must say, a very avid uh, fan of the Greek soccer team Panathinaikos. Uh, so he has written uh, a book uh, about Panathinaikos celebrating uh, its uh, centenary, I believe. And then uh, he has written about Greek Orthodoxy in America. And most recently, uh, about the uh, American Hellenic Progressive Association on its, uh, again, centenary, uh, that's AHEPA. And also an interesting book on uh, Greek owned diners in the States. So uh, Kitrev has been doing also other work, uh, uh, very interesting work with film director Maria Eliou as a historical consultant for five documentaries. Uh, the most recent one being uh, Athens from East to West, 1821, uh, nine, 1896, uh, which premiered in the Benaki Museum in Athens in 2020. That was a, the first one of a five-part series. Uh, before that, he had done a marvelous, uh, he had worked with Iliu to produce a, a marvelous uh, documentary on the Greeks of America called the Taxi, uh, the travel, the trip. Um, and um, that's really worth seeing for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, uh, he has, uh, in other words, as I see it, become the par excellence current historian of Greeks in America. So uh, before I pass the floor to him, uh, let me say briefly that we would like you to uh, record your questions in the Q&A um, uh, box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please do not use the, the chat box unless you want to but say congratulations or com give complaints. <laughs> but your questions, please, on the Q&A. Um, and as is the case with all our virtual lectures, 
as soon as Professor Kitraev concludes, we will uh, open the floor to our audience and receive and handle as many questions as we can. Thank you very much. Uh, Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Alexei, for that, uh, for the invitation and that uh, generous and uh, too long uh, uh, in introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, for being here with us uh, today and for your kind words. And thank you, uh, General Consul Strato Efimiu, for co-sponsoring this event. Um, American Philhellenism is a, a huge topic. Um, and uh, for that purpose, uh, I have decided to present an overview that will um, hopefully um, offer a, a no, uh, not only an overview, but an understanding of the content. And also uh, I will offer some interpretations of this extraordinary big phenomenon. It's always difficult when you start, you know, when you have a topic and you tell the audience, this is very big, this is very broad. Um, but what I think you will see is that there is a theme, a thread running through the relationship of America with Greece. And that is the message of freedom. The commitment to political and religious freedom was the point, a point of reference of the, American, of the Americans towards Greece and what made the Greek 1821 revolution so important for them. As I said, here on the left, you can see the full range of factors that attach to American Philhellenism. And Madam Ambassador mentioned the beginning, the foundations of America and the significance of ancient Greece for the foundation of America. And that was also part of the classical education, which was uh, important in America, especially from the early 1800s onwards. We saw that expressed in the existence of Greek revival architecture, again in the early 1800s. Right at that time, we have the first Americans who traveled to Greece. On the eve of the revolution, we have the correspondence between Thomas Jefferson and Avamandios Correis. We've got then the outbreak of the revolution and the American government response. And beyond the government response, we have an extraordinary range of reactions by important eponymous Americans and anonymous Americans all over the country. And that response was expressed through romantic poetry, through the arrival of American volunteers to Greece, through the creation of Greek committees that raised funds to support the Greek struggle, both for materials and for uh, humanitarian aid. We have, again, an extraordinary social and geographical spread of that solidarity towards Greece. Many people are also motivated by religion. And I will conclude this range I will be looking at by uh, examining the legacy of the significance of 1821, which uh, fuses into the beginning of the abolitionist movement in America. So as you can see, we have a full and quite extraordinary range of contacts between America and uh, Greece. Um, I consider myself a specialist on the history of the uh, Greek diaspora, and I, but I've known about American Philhellenism because the Greek American community has been so connected with 1821, the parades that we see in um, America, major American towns, on the anniversary of, uh, of 1821 uh, are uh, one example. Uh, there's 
um, Ahepa has consistently celebrated Philhellenism. Ahepa's book on the 50th anniversary of Ahepa in 1972 has several pages on, Phil on Philhellenism. And more recently, I got involved in a forthcoming short documentary entitled In Support of Liberty, Philadelphia and the Greek War of Independence. And um, I thank the uh, Ted Constas and Costis Kurelis and everyone else who's involved in that documentary for, for the material that I have learned and analyzed in the course of that. And finally, I should say I'm standing on, the, I'll make the, the, usual, the usual statement, I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. There are many, several colleagues who've been working on Philhellenism recently, and there's an extraordinary amount of very good work going on at the time, which is very inspirational. One of the first uh, examples of the contact of America with Greece. We talked about the foundation of America. The other one is Greek revival architecture, which uh, coincided with the growth of Philhellenism at the beginning of 1821. This is uh, an example. This is the second bank of the United States in Philadelphia, and the facade is a copy of the facade of the Parthenon. We also have the early travelers to Greece. These are the two first travelers, uh, Nicholas Biddle of Philadelphia and Edward Everett of Boston. They are the typical example of the classical scholar who is interested in learning more about Greece. The travelers were interested primarily in the ancient monuments, but by visiting Greece understood the plight of the modern Greeks under the Ottomans. And Nicholas Biddle will get involved in the, the uh, committee in Philadelphia. Edward Everett, I think we all know Edward Everett, the first classics professor at Harvard University, the founder of the uh, Greek committee uh, in Boston, and a, maybe the best known orator of antebellum and Civil War America. And of course, most Americans know Everett because he was the person who spoke just before Lincoln um, at Gettysburg. And as I think we also all know, uh, it was Lincoln's two minute address that uh, remained remarkable in history. Uh, Edward Everett had spoken before him for a very long time, but everyone remembers Lincoln. We as Greek Americans, and we, uh, I think, uh, remind Americans that Everett has a very important uh, history as a Philhellen and a classicist as well. After the revolution broke out in Greece in 1821, Everett, Biddle, and other Philhellenes put pressure on the American government to recognize the Greeks, to offer direct aid, military support. But this was a time in which the United States was very careful about its international relations and concerned that the European powers, especially Britain, might intervene in Latin America and use that intervention to maybe try and reverse what happened in America in 1776. So President Monroe at the time came up with the Monroe Doctrine. This is a much later cartoon of the um, on the of the uh, Monroe Doctrine, no trespass, America for the Americans, is the little sign on on this cartoon. So while Monroe and his uh, Foreign Secretary John Quincy Adams personally were sympathetic to the struggle of the Greeks because they saw a connection between the American struggle against the British 
and the Greek struggle against the Ottomans. However, to preserve uh, the integrity of America and we should say commercial interests of the United States um, in Europe came up with a Monroe Doctrine, which meant that the uh, America would not intervene in Greece for fear of the British and others uh, interfering in, um, in the Western Hemisphere. Not, not everyone in Washington uh, DC, of course, was in favor of the Monroe Doctrine. And one of the most outspoken supporters of Greece was Daniel Webster. In December of 1823, uh, Daniel Webster uh, um, made a resolution um, arguing that the United States should recognize and support Greece. And then he makes another very important Philhellenic speech, uh, Mr. Webster's speech on the Greek Revolution. You can see here. One of them was in December, the other one was in January as well. Daniel Webster was one of the strongest voices in Congress in favor of American support of Greece. With the government reticent and not inclined to offer Greece direct help, it was left to the citizens of America to show their support. We have, at the time, this is the romantic era of poetry and Lord Byron's poetry was very well known in the United States and several Americans came up with uh, Philhellenic poetry, if one way of, of calling it. Uh, William Cullen Bryant is maybe the best known of all. Uh, here on the right is the song of the Greek um, Amazon, I buckle to my slender side. Uh, Bryant, of course, uh, was a very, very well-known public figure. Um, those of you in New York, watching from uh, New York City at the moment will know, of course, that the park behind New York Public Library on the corner of 42nd and 6th Avenue is named Bryant Park after Bryant. Not everyone was eponymous. Uh, uh, Caroline Matilda Thayer, who's, who signed her poetry, Mrs. C.M. Thayer, was um, very active in the affairs of the Methodist Church and uh, uh, published a, uh, an ode to Greece, Sound the Loud Trump. It sounds something like something more contemporary. It's obviously the trumpet. Pittsfield is a, is a town in, uh, in Western Massachusetts. Sound the loud trump or the Aegean Sea. The Muslim has fallen and Greece shall be free. More direct help, of course, came with the American volunteers. And this is maybe the best known aspect of um, American Philhellen, uh, Philhellenism. Um, uh, John M. Allen is, um, is one example. Uh, Ahepa recently honored John uh, M. Allen in a ceremony. Uh, John M. Allen goes on and becomes a mayor of Galveston and is very active in the, um, in the affairs of Texas. Uh, on the left, wearing the F-Zone uniform is the most famous of all American volunteers. Of course, Samuel Gridley Howe of Boston, who um, upon his return to America, he, after going back and forth and soliciting help from the Boston and the New York and the other committees, Samuel Gridley Howe, of course, becomes a very important figure in antebellum and uh, uh, civil war America and his uh, um, and his his wife is also a very well known figure in America. So this is one person who we have a clear connection between the significance of Greece for Americans uh, through a very well known figure in America. George Jarvis um, was was the son of an American diplomat in Denmark, and he traveled to Greece 
and uh, fought. He saw action in Mesolonghi, and he saw action in the Morea as well. And George Jarvis's horse was named Bucephalus after Alexander the Great's uh, horse. Jonathan Peckham Miller, who is seen here in the, uh, the middle um, of all these slides, Jonathan Peckham Miller uh, was also one of the volunteers in Greece, very active, known for becoming an abolitionist after he returned to Vermont, having served in Greece. Uh, Jonathan Peckham Miller is one of the Philhellenes who brings back with him one of the Greek children, one of the Greek orphans, and his son, Lucas Miltiadis Miller, actually becomes a representative, a member of Congress for Wisconsin in the late 19th century. James Williams is an escaped slave from Baltimore who fights on the side of the Greeks. A range of types of Americans who decided to go over to Greece to fight as volunteers. Very much the theme here is not only just the passion for freedom that the Americans had and saw in the Greeks and decided to stand by the Greeks in solidarity, but also the broad range of persons who were part of the group of American volunteers. Back in America, we have the creation of Greek committees. These are committees by well-known citizens. The major three committees are in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, but uh, there are uh, committees or smaller groups and events. Again, and I can't emphasize this most in throughout America, in every small town, there appears to have been events, either formal committees, um, temporary committees, or just events that took place. Again, we see a range of Americans. Thomas Winthorpe, who was the president of the Boston Committee that Edward Everett formed was the son of um, English uh, immigrants to America. Um, William uh, Baird of New York was a banker in the city uh, of New York. And the person on the right, Matthew Carey, uh, the president and leader of the committee in Philadelphia was an Irishman who was an Irish nationalist and escaped Ireland uh, because of his activity, because his activities had, had been scrutinized by the British authorities and they, um, he was fearing arrest. Matthew Carey, of course, made the connection between the struggle of the Irish against the British and the struggle of the Greeks against the Ottomans. Uh, the Greek committees initially gathered material for the war. Towards the end of the revolution, they were very active in offering humanitarian aid to Greece through the funds that they raised. Uh, and a, a total of eight vessels were chartered and uh, filled with supplies and sent over to, uh, to Greece, uh, beginning with the Tontine, uh, sponsored by the Philadelphia Committee. And you can see these uh, eight vessels. The sponsoring committee is not totally accurate because a lot of the, the funds and the money was gathered in the rest of the country and funneled through New York. New York, in a sense, was the point of contact for all the committees uh, with Greece. But you can see the impressive um, number of vessels, the cargo value as well. In terms of today's dollar amount, you could roughly, very roughly, multiply by 4.5. The, the, those are, those are uh, obviously uh, values of the time, uh, you multiply those, those sums by uh, four and a half times and you get the, uh, uh, the, the value in today's dollars. 
um, quite impressive. And you see that it, it, it continues well after the Battle of Navarino in 1827, we still have vessels being uh, sent over to Greece. Uh, the range throughout the country. This is an example of American newspapers that reported on Greece on page one. To compile a list of all the American newspapers in the 1820s that reported on the situation in Greece, sympathetically, all of them would be almost impossible. They are literally a thousand, thousands. So this is just, uh, just, just an example of the newspapers that I have found in my research. Um, and what I've done is I've collected the, uh, the ones, the front, the ones that, that, that placed Greece on the front page. In some occasions, the front page, the whole of the front page was devoted to um, a report from Greece on how the Greek struggle was uh, unfolding. And you see it goes from, from New England, New England farmer of Boston and Vermont down to Florida, Arkansas, um, Charlton, uh, North and South Carolina, uh, Louisiana, uh, Alabama, um, and, uh, and Georgia. So this is an example of the geographical spread. It's, uh, you know, speaking as a researcher now, and, and obviously, you know, we historians, we tell everyone it's so exciting to be in archives. Um, as, as a historian and, and as a Greek, um, seeing the mentions and the content and the way that the Greek struggle is depicted by these American newspapers is, for me, was something much more than exciting. It was, it was quite, it's quite a moving experience to see the exposure that Greece had at the time throughout America. Looking at that range, one, one really has to now, and I want to turn to kind of just thinking about interpreting, understanding why this happened. Because we have the connection with classical Greece, but clearly there's, there's, there are many, many more factors that connect America to Greece. And to be sure, the Americans were supportive of the other revolutions that took place in, in uh, Southern Europe and other parts of the world throughout the, 19th, the early 19th century. But there was nothing as broad, deep and emotional and strong as the support for the Greek cause. To understand why that, I, I, I go back to my to, to my mention of the, the documentary we're doing about the Philhellenism in Philadelphia. And this is a sermon uh, by the Reverend uh, Gregory uh, T. Bedell, rector of St. Andrew's Church in Philadelphia. And he delivers a, a sermon in conjunction with the Philadelphia Greek Committee. He delivers this sermon in uh, February 1827 to rally support for Greece. And he really has, there's one section of the sermon where he says quite clearly, there are three reasons why we Americans should support the Greeks. First, because they are fighting for the freedom that we also fought for in 1776. Second, they are fighting as fellow Christians they are fighting for the freedom of their religion. There's an asterisk here, of course, because Badel and the Protestant clerics in America at the time were somewhat uneasy with the um, Greek Orthodox variety of the religion. And they explained to their audience that, that the, the Greeks have a different, it, it, they are Christians, but they, they, they have a different religion 
to us, but nonetheless, they're Christians and uh, uh, we ought to support them because of the oppression that they face um, and the, the limits that they have in exercising their religious freedom and so on and so forth. So there was an asterisk, but, but religion was the second reason. And the third reason was freedom from suffering. This is 1827. By that time, this is when Ibrahim's forces, of course, have rampaged throughout the Morea at the time, and the Greeks are suffering. I mean, the revolution is teetering on, on, um, on defeat, and which, which will be, um, that problem will be overcome with the Battle of Navarino. But the significant suffering, the volunteers, the letters of the volunteers, because the volunteers are con communicating with the, with the committees in Boston, in New York and Philadelphia, and explaining what's happening, explaining what they're seeing. And therefore, there is a great deal of solidarity because of the suffering that the Americans understand that the Greeks are going through um, in 1827 onwards. In thinking of those three reasons, freedom, religion, humanitarianism, there's a broader picture, obviously, that is, there's, that is at work here. And I want to just kind of think about the, the bigger picture. What's going on at the time? America and Greece at the time are being influenced by what historians have called the age of revolution. The age of revolution, of course, the Americans had sparked themselves in 1776, and the French Revolution had furthered in 1789. When we say age of revolution in terms of history, we don't mean it just descriptively. There's, there's a normative, there's, a, there's an interpretation of that that historians use. The age of revolution, we say age of revolution to distinguish this particular phase of history with prior events which were uprisings. And we do have prior uprisings against the Ottomans in um, the Morea uh, with, in the uh, late 1770s and earlier on. But in the age of revolution, these uprisings become successful and there is a spreading understanding throughout the world that people can take up arms against their oppress oppressors and overthrow them. That's what exactly why we use the term revolution. The Americans did it in 1776, the French do it in 1789, and the Greeks are doing it in the 1820s. So, and the Americans see this and they understand that what they did in the 1770s is what the Greeks are doing in the 1820s. That's the first big influence on the Americans. The second is, and I mentioned their discomfort with the non-Protestant version of Christianity, which Bedell in his sermon said, nonetheless, they're Christians, but there was something more than that going on in America at the time. And this was, and this takes us really into American history. And, and in a sense, American Philhellenism should be understood in American terms because it's an American phenomenon. This was what, uh, this was a, a historical moment, the early 1800s, uh, America was experiencing the so-called Protestant Second Great Awakening. It was a cultural, religious cultural movement that stressed that free will could lead to salvation. And in a sense, the Protestants saw the Greeks exercising their free will to save themselves. The Greeks were an embodiment of that, the principle of the Protestant Great Awakening. And in that sense, the struggle for Greek freedom was, uh, something that resonated with the Americans who were experiencing this uh, second great awakening and the emphasis on free will leading to salvation. And maybe, and to conclude, uh, 
The best example of the significance of and the connection of freedom in the minds of Americans when they looked at Greece is the inspiration that the Greek struggle bequeathed to the abolitionist movement. This, I think most people know or have heard of this statue. It's the statue of the Greek slave. I believe that there are three um, versions, uh, replicas of it. There's one in Washington, DC. There's one in the Brooklyn Museum. And I believe the other one is in New Haven, but I may be wrong on that. This is Hiram Powers, Greek slave statue, 1847, which uh, is displayed in New York and then tours the country and is a tremendous sensation in many ways. First of all, it's the first depiction of a nude. We're talking about a, a, a Protestant Puritan country. So this is the first depiction of, of a nude. The Americans, of course, were admirers of Greek classical um, um, art and culture, but they drew the line at nudity. But, but Hiram Powers' statue um, and the way that he uh, depicts this young woman who is a Greek captive who is being uh, sold as a slave and, and on her, near her, oh, one of her hands, there is, a, there is a, also a cross that, that, that uh, certifies that, uh, that this is a, a Christian woman who's being sold uh, as a slave. Um, the, uh, her appearance, her uh, obvious uh, innocence, the way that she looks away, uh, was helped Americans understand that this was this was a depiction of what was really going on to many people. They overcame their prudishness in some ways and made this connection between the horrors of uh, of slavery and uh, and art. The most important effect was, of course, that. At the time, the abolitionist movement was picking up in the United States and um, Frederick Douglass and other leading abolitionists made the obvious connection. They saw this statue as symbolizing not only uh, Greek slaves, but, but American slaves and saw that the Greek slaves and the American slaves, if the Greek slaves deserved to be liberated and sympathy, solidarity, and liberation, the same applied to the black slaves in America. And this for a couple of decades, at least became uh, a symbol of the abolitionist movement. In the picture you see on the right, you see very many women surrounding the statue that's being exhibited in New York. And this is my final point that, um, Many women were involved in the Philhellenic movement, and many of those women um, were, it, the Philhellenic movement was the first opportunity they had to become involved, involved in the public sphere. And the, um, they were able to move on to the abolitionist movement, making the connection with the statue. Women took up the cause of slavery, anti-slavery in the United States. Uh, as a continuation of their activity um, on behalf of Greece. Those are the many, many connections. I have tried to give you both the range and focus my interpretation on the issue of political and religious freedom. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kitraev. Alexander, this was a fascinating lecture. Um, let me take go to the questions. Um, there is uh, a question from uh, uh, there's a question from uh, Mrs. Stearns, Tony Stearns. Before I say to uh, 
give you the question I want to say to Mrs. Stearns, how, with, one, with how much affection we remember her late husband, Ambassador Monty Stearns, who served in Greece at a difficult time. Um, the question is, how did a freed American slave get to Greece? Um, Jarvis, uh, um, this is right. Um, we don't know. We know very little about uh, his movement. I believe he left from Boston. But what was happening at the time was, as you know, the slaves were moving up to the north, but you were not, you were still not, it, it was still not safe to be in the north. And many slaves went over to Europe. There's a number of slaves that went over to London. And I believe that he went over to London and then made his way to Greece with the help of the London Philhellenic Committee. So it was a roundabout, uh, it, it was a roundabout uh, trip for him, a voyage, uh, dare I say an odyssey, that took him from Baltimore up to Boston, across the Atlantic, uh, to London, and then through the Mediterranean to Greece. Uh, okay, there's a question from Stephen Ostro, uh, who wants to know uh, what you think about the disconnect between the coverage of Greek, uh, the Greek uh, War of Independence in Southern American newspapers, like in Louisiana and Alabama, and the fact that American slavery uh, was still going on in, that, in those regions? Uh, is there a disconnect there? What do you know about it? <laughs> there is a huge disconnect. And this was, of course, something that the abolitionists based their campaign on, because Greece was, in a sense, uh, they used Greece as leverage to remind people that uh, of the uh, hypocrisy of being concerned about enslaved Greeks, especially those who were enslaved in the course of the warfare against the Ottomans, and ignoring slavery at home. But this was, uh, th this is antebellum America. This is, th these are the tensions that America has at the time. Uh, love of democracy, of freedom, uh, classicism, but turning a blind eye or excusing maybe in some ways the existence of slavery in the, in the South. Yes, disconnect. Uh, Disconnect. <laughs> Almost, you could use a, you could use even a stronger term. Okay, uh, Leila Weinstein wants to know: Was there a philhellenic involvement in folklore collection in Greece as part of this movement? In other words, an attempt to connect nineteenth-century Greece to ancient Greece. Um, during eight, the 1820s? I imagine that's what the question is. Yes, no, I think the, the, the Greek folklore movement is, is of a later date, it's mid 19th century. And the connection between um, folklore and, and Greek tradition um, and the beginning of laografia, as we call it in Greece, as, as I understand the question, comes in the, in the mid 19th century. And the, at that time, the Philhellenist, Philhellenist movement has, has, has moved on into the abolitionist mode. Um, there's a question about um, Edward Everett from Elise Friedland, uh, who says, uh, can you speak further about Everett's specific involvement with American philhellenism, specifically regarding his impact on Webster's resolution. Yes, they were friends, uh, Boston-based friends, and Everett is, uh, in a sense, inspiring, persuading, cajoling Webster and giving him the material that Webster needs. Everett is maybe of, of, of all the persons that we have mentioned, and it's, uh, we don't want to be unfair to anyone, but, but intellectually, 
Everett is maybe the strongest uh, presence in terms of Philhellenism. Everett has gone over not only to Greece, but to Europe. He's met Korais. He's got a sense of both ancient Greece and the, the modern Greek struggle. And therefore he is the person who in fact inspires Webster. And uh, yes, thank you for that question because when we mention Webster's speeches, Everett is behind them. Okay. Um, um, Mr. Nicholas Sapunas uh, wants to know that there, he says there were committees uh, uh, in uh, Boston, in New York, in Philadelphia. Although there was action in the American South in terms of gathering supplies and money, why weren't there permanent committees in the South? Was it a cultural matter or an economical matter? Uh, he refers to slavery in the industrial economy in the North. That's a very good question. Um, fr from, what, from what we know, to, to answer backwards, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia have the, uh, the capital, the elite, the type of public figures who've got money and time to get uh, involved in the Greek struggle. And there is no contradiction between what they are doing with Greece and their attitudes towards slavery. And um, maybe in the Southern towns, the, that what the question is actually indicating very uh, interestingly is that the obvious contradiction between what's going on in the South uh, and solidarity with Greece meant that maybe a, a, a committee might, might, might find itself, might, it would be much more difficult for a committee to operate in the South. Yes. Okay. I want to warn you, you have a, a, a rollout of uh, a lot of questions, so, so uh, brace yourself. Okay. Uh, Dimitris Vuduris uh, wants to know on religion, when and where is the first Greek church established in the United States? Isn't it New Smyrna, by the way? Uh, well, there's a no, there's a shrine there, but uh, but but the first church is 1868, New Orleans, and I might get that year one or two. It's 1868, I think, New Orleans. I might be getting the year one or two years off. Uh, it's it's the church that the Benakis and others fund. This is this is taking us. Uh, off topic, but I'm glad to talk about it. These are the Greek cotton merchants that established themselves in New Orleans in the 19th century, um, trading in cotton. So in 1868, they established the first Greek Orthodox church, which becomes actually a, um, a church where other uh, Eastern Orthodox also worship until it becomes more um, narrowly speaking, a Greek Orthodox church in the early 1900s. Good. Uh, Todd Sedgwick, uh, former CYA student, alumnus, and ambassador of Sedgwick, he says, did American Philhellenes continue to be involved and engaged with Greece after independence? Not so much. The, the, committees, the, the committees themselves were... Uh, Throughout the 1820s, the committees kind of ebbed, their, their activity ebbed and flowed in any case. And the independence that, that Greece gains and the arrival of Kapodistrias in Greece and the fact that now there is an authority in Greece uh, administering uh, to the humanitarian aid means that those committees cease their operations. Um, the United States uh, will recognize Greece uh, actually uh, slightly late, 1837. And from then on, the, it's, it's really official diplomatic representatives who are handling the um, relations between uh, the two countries. Okay. Uh, Emmanuel Savas asking, is asking, uh, what about the naming of so many cities in the United States? Um, after Greek cities, and well, I know yeah. there's a Sparta in Tennessee, and an Athens, Georgia, and a Apollo in Pennsylvania, Corinth in New York. 
Delphin, Indiana. Uh, they're very, they're very many. Obviously, you know. The naming of the naming of those cities begins in the early 1800s, and it has to do with the um, embrace of classicism, uh, both Roman and uh, and Greek. So the so you've got you know they're both Greek and a few cities that have Greek and Latin names are established and take that name before 1821. But with 1821, there are more, there's a greater number of cities. So for instance, you know, in, in New York, you've got, um, I think Ithaca is before 1821. Greece, New York is around 1821. And of course, um, Ypsilanti, Michigan is, uh, is 1821. So it's an, it's an early 1800s phenomenon. First it's classicism, and then it's uh, the Greek revolution. Okay. Diana Honey says, did you find any connections to American Southern slaves following the Greek war through newspapers, etc.? cetera? Uh, in other words, what did so, they know about it? You know, this is... So, so there is one, so there's one newspaper in uh, in uh, Alabama. The, the, new, the two newspapers in Alabama and Georgia, which uh, I've looked at and uh, was very surprised at the extent of the coverage. When I said that one a few newspapers had the whole of the, the front page, I believe that there were, um, it's both in Georgia and Alabama, those newspapers were covering uh, covering Greece extensively. So to the extent, of course, we don't know, but to the extent that the newspapers existed, um, it's very likely that um, the, uh, what was going on in Greece became broadly known in those Southern states as well. It's, uh, it's a, that's, that's an, another interesting uh, thing to pursue. Um, Vicky Kiriakos is asking you, to say something about Emma Willard, whose name is the same for the girls' boarding school in upstate New York. Uh, did she help raise funds for the Greek Revolution? Do you know anything I, about that? I, I believe she's one of the many examples of the women who were involved in, in the committees and the Philhellenic movement. Um, I, um, memory doesn't serve now whether she was because we've got the, the women involved in the Philhellenic movement and we've got the women in, uh, involved in the missionary movement as well, which in a sense, the, the missionaries piggyback on the Philhellenic movement and uh, engage in their own activities and women are present in both those phases. Um, okay, uh, there's a question from Nicholas Petzas about uh, you know, what should Greek Americans, um, how should they view Philhellenes who volunteered for the war as honorary Greeks like Lord Byron, or should they go even further and call them Greeks themselves? <laughs> so, you know, as I said, I, reading about Greek American newspapers, I was aware of the Philhellenic movement because it's, it appears, you know, every 25th of March, you've got articles in uh, the newspapers and the publications uh, uh, of Greece. Um, I, the Philhellenic movement is very much part of American history as well, aside from being obviously important for Greece. So um, I think they are both, they should be honorary Americans, honored as, as, as Americans and honored as Greeks as well. You know, we, we talk, you know, and there's a lot of academic talk about transnational history, you know, going away from the history of one nation and looking at the connection between uh, one or two nations. And I think the Philhellenes straddle both, both America and Greece. Uh, okay, Alexander Musas uh, says that Michael Anagnos uh, of the Perkins School, uh, Anagnostopoulos, Anagnos, you know, has formed an organization to invite business uh, inclined individuals from Greece to the United States. Do you have any information about this? 
about the efforts or the organizations that resulted from this movement. Yes, wow, this, this again takes us to the second, uh, second half of the 19th century. Um, this is Samuel Gridley Howe, the volunteer, goes back to Greece in the 1860s to get involved with the Cretan struggle. Uh, during his stay in Greece, Anagnos becomes his secretary and brings Anagnos back to Boston and Boston becomes the, gets involved with the Perkins School of the Blind that Samuel Gridley Howe's family were involved in establishing. Um, and so Anagnos becomes this other very interesting example of, of transnational history. But, but um, I'm not aware of the, of, of the, of the business connections. Um, okay, Rene Papas uh, is, is, says, can you speak about the uh, Fitzgreen Halleck poem called Marco Bozzaris? Um, there was a, apparently there was a performance in New York City last year or some time ago. Uh, and in connection to that, I would say, you know, perhaps you can connect your answer with the importance of um, Child Harold's pilgrimage um, Byron's uh, poem, uh, how it uh, influenced uh, the whole the whole movement. Uh, we know that, for example, that Everett had the poem with him when he visited Greece. Uh, from what I know, um, yeah. He... Yes, the the Botzeri's poem appears on a number of again American newspapers. It's front page news. And this, this, is, this is why I, I included that little segment on, on romantic poetry of which the poem about Bozaris is one of, the, one of the examples. There's a couple of books that have been written about the poetry. The poetry is, is, is extensive. And I, uh, that's why I just picked two representative figures. But the, Marco, the Marcos Bozzaris poem may be the most evocative one in terms of energizing people because it speaks to the uh, significance of romantic poetry in America at the time and talks about the heroic deeds for freedom as well and kind of combines them as well. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ideal example. Yes, thank you for bringing it up. Um, Professor Marinatos, Nano Marinatos, um, says, um, how did the information about the revolution reach the American people? Through the press? And if so, what got the press interested? It's not obvious that uh, an issue in the Ottoman Empire would, would create an interest in, uh, in the American public. I think she, she says Greek public. I think she means the American public. Yeah. <laughs> So there are two parts to this. First of all, the technical one is that it's um, the London newspapers are reporting on Greece and the, initially the American newspapers uh, are picking up and reproducing information from the Times and other British newspapers. After a while, we've got the volunteers writing letters so we have, I don't know, Jarvis or, or, or Gridley Howe's letters being published in the, news, in the American newspapers. So you have a direct uh, connection with the ships that are going back and forth. Why they should be interested, I think, speaks to the, to the core issue that we're looking at here. I think the fact that there is a two things, a people who the Americans associate with the glories of classical Greece are engaged in a revolution. That's the one thing that strikes them. And the second thing is because it's a, a struggle for freedom as well, which they relate to, those two things, I think, give, give this um, traction and this might give this these this news such mileage and tremendous popularity 
and the American newspapers decide to publish it. And again, if you look at the coverage over the 1820s, it's not as if it was, you know, one event to, you know, okay, 1821, 22, and, and now it's done, we go on to other things. It's continuous, extensive, and uh, continues throughout the, the 1820s. A fascination with the heirs of classical Greece fighting for freedom. Um, how's your stamina? Uh... Alexander, because, because we've got some questions here. Oh, That's you, fine. Can you go? Yes. <laughs> All right. Want some water? <laughs> I have, I have. Okay. Um, Mary uh, Mame Russell says, uh, to, to what extent were commercial interests, uh, interests drivers of those advocating for Greek freedom, including those on the committees themselves, on the committee leaderships? Mame, Mame Russell is a understand a alumna of CYA. Yeah, the the uh, the commercial those thinking commercial interests were not sympathetic to Greece, or or at least maybe privately they were sympathetic to Greece, but didn't want any official engagement because the big trading partner, of course, was the Ottoman Empire. So whenever anyone thought commercial interests, that meant and and the and uh, and America, uh, the United States was sending agents to talk to the Ottomans at the time for potential uh, trade agreements. Uh, Greece at the time was was still in 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 revolutionary fervor, so it didn't uh, it didn't present offer anything as interesting in terms of commerce uh, compared to the huge Ottoman Empire. Remember, if you think about the Ottoman Empire, this extensive territorial domain, it's only one little bit of it, that one little part that's breaking away. So if you're interested in, in commerce, you're looking to Constantinople, not, not what's going on in the Morea. Um, there's an interesting question about slavery here from Fagelis Economo, he says, uh, since Greece had slavery in the in the old days, what, what, was this used as an excuse for slavery in the South? In other words, uh, it, it, Greece was uh, inspiring good things uh, when it came to uh, the revolution. But what about slavery in the South? Was was Greece an excuse for that? Yes, although I'm not an expert on. Um the American pro-slavery discourse, but yes, uh, that was the case, that in some, some of the persons who wanted to excuse or justify uh, slavery in the South pointed to, to ancient Greece and uh, saying that ancient Greece had uh, slavery, therefore that should not be something that... Um, we are um, obliged to reconsider. We are doing what the ancient Greeks did as well. This was a discourse though that was limited in the Southern states, but it did, I have seen examples of that. It did exist. Um, there's a question about uh, the end of the Greek uh, revolution and how was that addressed, celebrated in the American press? Navarino. It was really the, the, the naval battle of, of Navarino was seen as the end of the revolution and a, uh, a, 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 a justified event that brought an end to the suffering of the Greek people. And of course, the assumption was that now the Greeks are going to become free very much. So if you look at the, uh, at, at the coverage after uh, with with the Battle of Navarino, it's really seen as the as the um, the triumph of the Greeks. Not so much that the Greek that the uh, great powers intervened, more the fact that the Greek people are now going to be free. Okay, um, Michael Seaman says in the 18th century, the British Grand Tourists were too fearful to travel to Ottoman Greece, and so drew inspiration for Greek architecture from the newly discovered ancient Greek polis in southern Italy, Festum, Pestum, ancient Posidonia, which was 
a final stop on the Grand Tour after Naples. You mentioned Biddle, Biddle, Biddle's travel to Greece in 1806. When did Americans find it safe enough to travel to Greece and what, if anything, made it safer to travel there as opposed to traveling in the 18th century? Nice. It's, um, so it's, it's 1804 and 1806 is Biddle and Everett and they may be an American that goes there earlier than that, but um, I'm not sure I can answer that. I think at that time, I think the Americans feel confident enough as Americans to travel to Ottoman Greece because they're not identified with the, um, with the old European powers. So in that sense, I think, and it's this, this wave of, uh, of, of classicism that exists. You know, I think again, um, many things in history, you know, one of them takes the chance, goes to Greece, makes it, and that opens the door for the others. But that would be an interesting to consider the security considerations, whether they had them at the time or not. Okay, there's a question, uh, well, the, the issue of scandal always comes up, you know, no matter what you discuss. So there's a question here from Michael Conaris uh, about the frigates. frigates. Uh, and how, <laughs> well, the scandal about the frigates, commissioned frigates, and how it impacted US perceptions of modern Greeks. You know, one, first of all, the, uh, the, the scandal of the frigates is that, you know, money is raised to, uh, to build two frigates for the Greeks and the shipbuilders charge so much uh, at the end that you've got to sell one of the frigates to, to pay for the, for the other one. So you, land, you end up with one, you've paid for two frigates and you, you end up in, with one. But at least with some newspaper reports that I've seen and some of the, some of the writings of colleagues, it, it actually galvanizes people. People kind of write it off as, as things have not gone well with raising funds and the shipbuilders have been dishonest and there's not been good administration. So in that sense, we should uh, reinforce our um, activities in support of Greece. And since we're talking about scandals, we should also mention, of course, that, that there was many instances in um, when the supplies arrived in Greece where the, uh, the, the supplies were, were for humanitarian, for the suffering civilians, and in many cases, military chiefments, chieftains availed themselves of some of those supplies for their own men, which wasn't the original idea. So there's, there, there, there were those instances as well. And there were reports of those instances again, but I think the public, the public was 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 in support, and those those scandals and those incidents of of uh, misdirected uh, funds and supplies didn't didn't dampen the, the 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 fervor. It's it's you know the expression was Greek fire, Greek fervor uh, in the eighteen twenties. So those the, the scandals were certainly were there, but. But they 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 didn't uh, they didn't stop the the fever and, and the fire. Uh, Jennifer Niles is asking you: Were American philhellenes disappointed or surprised that the Greeks opted for a monarchy? Well, they opted for a monarchy a few, a few years later, of course. Yes, there was, yes, there was talk, there was talk. Initially, the Greeks, I think, said, of course, we're going to do a, a, a republic. But I think, I think the Americans were, were concerned, having seen the, um, the influence of the, of, the, of the great powers, and especially Britain. So I do, I do think that, uh, I'm not sure if it was how, how public or private it was, but there was a, there was a concern about um, whether the, the Greeks would be able to establish a republic given the presence of the great powers. Um, Niki Athanasiou wants to know um, regarding the North-South split of support, could it be that the economic power of the American South 
was distributed to big landowners with in big, in big or small towns versus Boston, New York, Philadelphia, that were urban centers with more focused intellectual pursuits and economic power. Yes, I mean, I didn't, I hadn't kind of thought of it in terms of a split, but in terms of that the, um, that exactly that the 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 classicists the uh, the elites were in the, in the northeast and the uh, the southern states would have been you know obviously less open to to uh, to a struggle for freedom in europe and maybe less interested in in classical greece but yes i think i think the the i, I would agree I, I think there is um, I've got to think about whether I'd call it a split, but but clearly there are reasons why the South is less less active. Yes, yeah, you know, those are the reasons. I'm being told by the control, you know, as they do in television, that um, we're supposed to be wrapping it up. But I, I have a, a couple of questions more that I want to uh, to put to you. Well, Phoebe Siegel, uh, another uh, CYA alumna, says American support for Crete continued after the Greeks obtained independence. Can you say more about that? The, uh, for Crete. Crete. Yes. Yes, the Cretan struggle is, that's, I mean, the Cretal, the Cretan struggle is a, is, a, is, is, a, is a small example of the way that maybe, if, if it's not exactly an organized philhellenic movement, but it's certainly a, a strand of sympathy that exists in the United States for the Cretan struggle. And, but it's really picks up after the uprising of 1860 in which uh, Samuel Gridley Howe is involved. And from 1860 right through to the 1890s and the early 1900s, there's extensive uh, um, coverage of the Cretan um, struggle for union with Greece. And we could say in a sense, that that's that that is a a continuation of the of the solidarity uh, offered for 1821. Uh, you know there are lots more questions, but um, I, I think really we're running out of time here. I'm only going to give you uh, one more from Peter Bean, who says, Professor Bean, you didn't mention Rome. Wasn't classicism as an influence in American architecture and idealism? really more Roman influence than Greek influence? Um, Haverford College alum, Alexi, since you're mentioning the college here in Athens, I, I'll mention Haverford College with Peter Bean. But um, uh, yes, I mean, Rome, there's, there's a rule of thumb that the early Republic is more interested in Rome, ancient Rome, because of the statesmen and uh, and 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 the uh, the structures of government. And after the uh, the War of eighteen twelve onwards, there's a turn towards towards Greece. Um, it's 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 a rule of thumb that isn't very strict, of course, because we saw that there was travel to Greece before before eighteen twelve, but. But but yes, there is the there is the the Roman influence through the 18, 1812, and then and then the Greek classical uh, influence becomes very strong. And again, this rule of thumb is that that the ancient Greece is important in the American mind from from eighteen twelve to about the American Civil War, and prior to that, it's Rome, and therefore that's why you have. Towns, you know, there's Latin, Latin, you know, there's Virgil, New York, I think, is, is a town that is, that is established in the early 1800s. Okay, and uh, we're going to close here, but one okay. last one. Uh, two, two, I'm going to um, contract two, two questions into one. An anonymous says, uh, did the American federal government officially support the Greek Revolution, or was it neutral? And then Leo Drolles is asking, whether he says Britain, France, and Russia helped the Greek struggle, why not the American Republic? Mon the, Truman, the, the, yes. the Monroe Doctrine, right? Yes, Monroe Doctrine. So uh, America 
maintained a neutrality because of the Monroe Doctrine. Um, a, a frigate was was sent uh, to Greece and sailed off the coast of Greece in the early part of the of of the revolution as a as a sign of solidarity. But there was no direct involvement. I I believe uh, General Consul um, Stratos Ephthimiu on the on the consulate's Facebook page has a photograph of that vessel, I believe. He's also, since I'm mentioning that, he's, he's also got information about the actual woman who was used as a model for the Greek slave um, um, statue uh, who was captured in Zmyrna. Um, but back to international politics, um, it's, it's the Monroe Doctrine. Right at that time, America is, is it's not 100% sure of itself. I, you know, I think there's serious, there's serious fears that, that the British can use the excuse of getting involved in the Western hemisphere to, to, to get back at the Americans. So there is this clear Monroe Doctrine uh, solution to this problem that you, know, you don't get involved in our backyard and we won't get involved in yours. So. Um, that was that. That was why we have American neutrality. Of course, the great powers got involved also because they were concerned about the Ottoman Empire, and they were also concerned that one or the other of Britain, France, or Russia might take an might uh, the Greek outcome might be advantageous to them. So they all got involved so that they make sure that the others didn't get an advantage. So there's there's. It's the, it's the great powers, what can I say? It's, it's uh, politics and interest. Isn't it like that every time? <laughs> well, Alexander, um, you know, this has been fascinating, a great exchange. Uh, you know, I want to apologize to all those who have uh, written down their questions and we really don't have time to, to, to answer them. Um, we, I can send them on to you actually, and maybe we can contact these people and, and give them the responses. One, one last comment that, that I see here, which is worth going away with, is uh, to, to reflect on the fact that, uh, you know, American Philhellenes were inspired by ancient Greece and, well, all that happened as a result contrast this with the present movement uh, to, um, let's say, ban uh, Homer from uh, curriculum of certain schools and so forth. Don't comment on that. This is really, it's not, it's not, there's no time for it, but let's take it away with us. Uh, and um, the anti-classicist movement, in other words. Uh, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, you've been a wonderful speaker and, uh, uh, and, um, with these words, I'm going to uh, ask the ambassador if she's still with us, uh, because I think she had another commitment to uh, say a few words to conclude this event. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I had another commitment, I postponed it a little because the, the lecture was fascinating and the facts that I personally learned uh, uh, were amazing. Uh, I, I, just one comment, when you spoke about New Orleans, Louisiana and the Benaki family, uh, I was consul uh, in New Orleans 30 years ago and we did some research that time, uh, 1860. Benakis, Adonis Benakis was appointed as Greek consul in New Orleans and he was, he was the first official Greek appointment in the United States. But uh, there is a lot to discuss about the Greek community in New Orleans that it's probably after St. Augustine, one of the oldest in the United States. Um, I, I don't want to to, to, to uh, you know, the, the, the lecture was fascinating, it was amazing, but I want to, to just point out some thoughts that I have regarding, regarding Philhellenism, not only the United States, not only the time of uh, uh, the Greek Revolution, but more general, because Philhellenism is, uh, is a movement, is a, is a trend uh, that we can find in many different periods of history uh, in many, many countries. Uh, and uh, 
uh, always I was thinking, what is the trigger for feeling this? What makes all these people um, uh, come so close to Greece uh, and to Hellenism and devote uh, their thoughts and their life and their time uh, to supporting Hellenic causes? Uh, I use the word Hellenica on purpose uh, because I think feeling is something bigger than modern day Greece uh, as a geographical and state entity. Uh, Philolinism is something to do with um, culture, uh, ideology, philosophy. It's about attitude towards life. Uh, and all this is based uh, on what uh, um, Hellenes, Sons and Greeks uh, created uh, uh, 2000 years ago. Um, it, it's the cultural element that is so prevalent uh, when it comes to Philolinism, to this movement. Uh, and uh, Another element is also the presence of Greek communities around the world. Um, I don't think there is any place uh, in any time of history where you cannot find some Greek uh, element. So uh, the combination of the cultural power, the ideological power of Hellenism, together with the presence uh, of Greek communities uh, that are usually characterized by hard work uh, and uh, uh, devotion to family and the community, I think is what triggers uh, uh, these uh, um, uh, feelings, uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, attachment, uh, uh, and this affinity to whatever is called Hellenic. Um, but this is my, my personal remarks. I'm not an historian and I'm not a political scientist, uh, but these are two common threads that I find throughout uh, Philhellenic movements uh, at different times of history. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Philoctopoulos. Of course, I thank the Consul General of Boston, in Boston and uh, uh, Mr. Femiu, and uh, definitely Mr. Kitroev uh, was uh, a fascinating lecture, a fascinating time. Thank you.